Welcome to Hard Count Sports, where we have a special conversation to bring you. We're very excited to be joined with a coach who has over 30 years of coaching experience in NFL Europe, the CFL and college football. He's the special teams coordinator for the Hamilton Tiger Cats. You may know him from the, being a pundit on Sky Sports NFL, and he also has a, a podcast called Coffee with Coach. We are very pleased to welcome Jeff Reinbold. Jeff, welcome to the show. Appreciate you guys having me, man. I Good to have you, Jeff. I got to tell you something. I really admire you guys for what you're doing, man. Just starting Appreciate one it. up and, and uh, yep. Yep. Your, your subject matter is really cool, too. I think that's awesome. Well, thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate Whereabouts it. in the world are you and what are you getting up to at the minute? <laughs> <laughs> man, I am in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada right now, and I am under <laughs> house arrest. I'm like on oh. my sixth. This is my sixth quarantine. I've about had enough quarantine with mm. COVID-19, but we are about ready to start our season. The uh, Canadian government mm -hmm. has given 16 us 16 days. Yeah. We got, we got to play and, and we're going to go through the same things that the NFL went through last year with all the mm -hmm. COVID restrictions and meetings are all done virtually and social distancing and masks and the whole deal, but at least we get to play. Yeah, definitely. that's it. That's the main thing. And I heard that you were coaching in the Spring League in Houston. Could you tell us a wee bit yep. about that experience as yep. well? Yeah, you know what? The Spring League is really, to me, a great experience. Um, for us coaches, uh, it's an opportunity to get, you know, you, you don't get better at anything unless you do it. And so when you mm -hmm. coach, you get better as a coach. And it was fun because there were a lot of guys that were, you know, ex-NFL guys, older guys, whatever, um, and, and I told my wife the first day we were down there, I said, this is like being at, a, at the NCAA coaches convention when you're a kid. And, you know, you're mm -hmm. working with working and, and competing against guys that are some of the biggest names in the business. Uh, and you're working with young kids that just really want a chance. They, they're looking mm -hmm. for a reason to, to, for somebody to, to sign them. You know, COVID has screwed up so many things yeah. in the world. And for really two draft classes, it's been really, really difficult because the scouts couldn't get out and evaluate. There was no combine, you know, mm -hmm. all the, all the kind of like borderline kids from small schools didn't get opportunities to have, you know, pro days. So uh, there are, there is a glut right now of really good football players. And then on top mm -hmm. of it, we had some other guys who like Brandon Marshall, who has two Super Bowl rings from his yeah. time with, the, with the Broncos is, was with us and, and uh, a kid named uh, Ellerby who's been in the NFL for, I don't know, probably two or three teams. You know, those were the kind of guys that were just looking for another opportunity to go back. You know, mm. So it was young yep. kids, it was guys looking for a second chance, and it was good. It was a good experience. You mentioned the pro days there, and I want to take it uh, to that. We saw, you know, pro days were interesting because we saw a lot of uh, – Maybe times coming out of that 40-yard dash times weren't so reliable. Um, now that was a whole talking point. Jeff, what's your opinion on the 40 times that came out of some of those pro days? Were they well, all set 4-2, four 4-3? Four well, first of all, like, you know, I've, I've been around some really fast guys. And I mean really, yeah. really fast guys. And I think Rocket Ishmael might – be the fastest player I've ever actually been on the field with. Mm -hmm. um, and let me tell you something. Like, when he ran, it was completely different than other guys. And he was, mm -hmm. a, he was like a 4-3 guy. So for, to, I can't even imagine what a 4-2-9 or a 4-2-6, mm -hmm. one of those guys would be. Because I mean, I'm just telling you, when, mm -hmm. when, when Rocket took off, it was like you'd go, holy shit. Mm. Um, so, you know, I, and the other thing is, to be honest with you guys, what I've learned over time is the 40-yard dash, which was developed by Paul Brown way back in the 50s because there was, there was no common denominator that you could evaluate players on. All you could see is watch, you'd watch tape and see if they were fast. It didn't tell you who they were competing against or anything. So he wanted to set a benchmark for an exercise that you could evaluate all players on the same continuum. And so he developed the 40-yard dash test. Mm -hmm. But, guys, to be honest with you, that now 
it kind of really outlived its usage, mm-hmm. but we cling on to it we do, because yeah. it's like it's like we say the guy who wins wins the hundred meters at the Olympic is the fastest man in, in mm. on on the planet. Well, mm-hmm. maybe. Because pace doesn't really come into the game. Well, of course it does, but it doesn't come into the game to that extent. You know, you're not sitting watching every play saying, oh, look how fast that guy can run. I wonder, you know, what his 40 time would be. It is outdated. And even on Instagram, Twitter, a lot of analysts and uh, teams and and scouts of teams probably make quite a big deal of it and and maybe blow it up to the degree that it shouldn't be. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, now I'll reference it because it's the one thing that you can like I say, it's a standardized measurement, right? It's like yeah, saying a guy's yeah. six a guy's six feet tall or a guy weighs yeah. 300 pounds. Yeah. But it's not the end-all, be-all. Yeah, because yeah. I, I've been around so many guys that can't translate that 40-yard time into playing fast. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you two, two examples of guys that I know personally and have coached. When Emmanuel Sanders went to the combine, he ran – about like I think it was four five three, all right. And they said mm-hmm. it hurt him, and he dropped in the in the draft because they said he was too slow. When mm-hmm. Cole when Cole Beasley went to the draft, he ran like four uh, went to the combat. He ran like four five two, and mm-hmm. everybody said, "Well, there's no way he can play in the NFL at five eight, 170 pounds, and mm-hmm. running running four five. Mm-hmm. But what they forgot to understand is, first of all, you got to catch the thing. Yeah, exactly. Right, the receiver. And secondly, you got to know how to use your speed. And both mm-hmm. Emmanuel and Cole are extremely good at what we call short burst with, with short burst quickness. It's the ability to get going from one direction to another direction as quickly as possible up to full speed. Mm-hmm. So neither Cole nor, nor or, and Emmanuel can a little bit, but Cole's not going to beat you over the top they're not you're not gonna you're not gonna see him with a lot of 65 yard catches mm-hmm. yeah unless he catches it you yeah, know you catches see him underneath and make somebody dying miss. Dying yeah. situations yeah. but yeah. it's his ability to function in short space yeah. that makes him yeah. such a great player and his and his mm-hmm. great hands and his competitiveness and all that mm-hmm. so there are two guys right there that have both been playing 10 years in the national football league and are two of the better receivers in the league that had very very average 40 yard dash times Mm -hmm. yeah definitely and i was actually going to ask you about emmanuel sanders and your personal relationship with him because i'm actually a broncos fan myself and emmanuel was a you know a big part of super bowl 50 uh, one of peyton manning's favorite targets as well so what was it like to coach him and as well cole beasley as well um whenever you were smu i tell you what both of them were very similar in one regard is they absolutely believed that nobody could guard them, that nobody yeah. could. could <laughs> well, stop them. You have to have that mindset. That's exactly correct. And, you know, in a way, and, and it's a funny word because it, it has a negative connotation, but it shouldn't when mm-hmm. you talk about athletes. Because we talk about they were both arrogant. Mm-hmm. And what, that, what, was, what mm-hmm. I'm saying by that is they weren't arrogant people. It's just that they were arrogant about their ability. They mm-hmm. did not mm-hmm. believe that anybody anybody could guard him like cole beasley is five eight and a half he weighs about 170 maybe 80 pounds now and when he looks in the mirror when he shaves in the morning he sees he sees a guy six three and you know built like yeah yeah, yeah. it's just he doesn't he he has no fear that he's not good enough he yeah yeah, i can remember i I remember his freshman year, and this is when you really find out about guys. We're playing Tulsa, and we're not very mm-hmm. good. And, you know, we got a chance late in the game. Um, we got, we got like, there's maybe 30 seconds left to go in the game. We got the ball inside of Tulsa's 15-yard line. Mm-hmm. and we ha- But we have to score a touchdown to win. Right? Okay. So it's fourth down. And we call a play in the run and shoot. And the, the play re- is requ- requires that the slot back runs a corner route if he sees blitz coverage, right? Okay, yep. So they, show, mm-hmm. right. they walk down and they show blitz early. And here it comes. And the quarterback sees it and throws a perfect ball to Cole over the shoulder, mm-hmm. just like this. Right. 
was going to be the touchdown to win the game, and he dropped. Oh, oh no. And so that's when you find out about who that guy is, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I went into the locker room after the game to, to talk to him, and he didn't really want to have much to say, and he looked me right in the eye, and he goes, I'll never drop another one. Mm-hmm. And he worked so hard at his hands. Like, I mean, he, both of them were incredible workers and he worked so hard his hands. And I think about when I watch him now, he lays out and like against Indianapolis where he lays out and catches a ball for a big first down late in the yep. game to keep a drive alive. Mm-hmm. And he's playing with a broken leg. And I think, <sighs> yeah, yeah, remember that? Remember that? I, I, I think to myself, you know, that's why he's who he is because he's yeah. just so determined. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. Though. And, and that is, you're, you're right, he is a determined player. And, and every time I watch the Bills offense and Josh Allen throws him that ball, you know when he gets the shoulder down, it's game over for the yep. defensive back. Yep. 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 And, you know, like I said, he's, he's smaller than me. I mean, he's mm-hmm. really small. You know, you, you've asked about Emmanuel. I'll, I'll give you a story about Emmanuel. When, they were, when he was with San Francisco, you know, and he's yeah, he's I remember that well. He's one of the few guys that's that's played for multiple Super Bowl teams mm-hmm. with, with multiple teams. Yeah. But late in the game, um, they've got to have a big play. And mm-hmm. they played brackets coverage against Emmanuel and shoved the safety to double teaming from inside. And he, he runs a perfect route against that coverage. He hits a, he goes to the outside guy and, and mm-hmm. bangs him and then break, breaks inside yeah, yeah. and splits yeah. the bracket. And he's about three yards past the safety. Mm-hmm. And all Jimmy has to do is put it on him. Put the ball on target. Yep. And, and they're Super Bowl champions. It's in yes. the last minute yeah. of the game. And oh. Jimmy overthrew him by about three feet. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and I, that's, I think I, that's the point that, that the 49ers realized to themselves, we need a new QB in here. Because this well, guy, can't th- he can't throw to an open target. Well, he's got to get better at that. And when I he saw him too much in the run game. game. Yeah, I, I, I saw Emmanuel after the game, and I rode around in a, you know, like a golf cart that they had just mm-hmm. so I could get him away from the people and I could talk yeah. to him. Yeah. And he was so distraught, and he, but he wasn't distraught for himself. He was mm-hmm. distraught because he knew that what they he, – he's such a great competitor, you know, and the great competitor, they want that ball. They want mm-hmm. that opportunity mm-hmm. Definitely. to make mm-hmm. that play. Mm-hmm. Definitely, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah. That was also a bad game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, because I, oh, I'm a 49ers fan, and I remember watching that game. And the Chiefs had gone up. Uh, they just, I think they, they got an interception, didn't it? And it was the last play of the night. Uh, it was fourth down. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was fourth down. And Jimmy threw that ball end zone. I thought, yes, this is the moment we take it. Ah, he overshot it by three feet. And the guy just didn't have the touch on the ball that he needed. And he's too, he's, he relies on the running game too much. And like when you're throwing to a guy like Emmanuel Sand- Sanders, if you give him the ball, even in his vicinity, mm-hmm. you know that he's going to catch it. But that was just too far. Um, and you can't blame Emmanuel for that. But obviously he now ends up on the Buffalo team, which has Cole Beasley on it. You put those two guys in the same offense, Jeff. What are you? What are your expect expectations? Sorry, uh, for the Bills well, this season. Well, I think when you when you look at an offense, you got to look at the whole picture. And so, for the Buffalo Bills, I, I, you know, and, and Cole said this to me the other day. I told him, I said, Cole, I think this is your year to go to the Super Bowl. And he said, We've mm-hmm. got to because our offense is going to be so good. And I really truly believe that they are because if you you take Emmanuel and then you take Cole and then you sprinkle in Stefan Diggs and yep. you know th- they've got you know their tight ends are Croft's a good good young tight end they got great running backs the offensive line comes back you know if Josh continues to grow as a quarterback like he did last year I don't know if he can take another big step like he took last mm-hmm. year but mm-hmm. certainly he's going to play with huge confidence and those guys are all alpha males they're all some of the best players at their position in the National Football League. So 
you know, the, the Bills have done so much right since uh, Sean got there and, and Brandon Bean got there. And they started, mm -hmm. you know, they, mm -hmm. they got rid of – and they got rid of a lot of good players, and yeah. some big name players, because they were guys that just weren't going to be – they weren't going to be the kind of guy that they wanted to build yeah, their. Yeah, it didn't fit the image. Yeah, it's you know, so you take yeah. a guy like 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 Darius, that big nose tackle that they had as a Pro Bowl, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And they get mm -hmm. rid of him and send him to Jacksonville, and he's out of the league three years later because yeah. you know couldn't stay. He can't he can't stay in shape. He's always a problem off the field. All that kind of. Stuff. They got rid of those guys, or, or mm -hmm. almost all of those guys, and they started bringing in guys that really fit the profile of what they wanted when Cole got signed like I hadn't coached Cole in god I think seven years at that point but I got a call from the Bills mm -hmm. and Ooh. they they called me on three separate occasions doing background work on Cole and oh. you know I hadn't I hadn't coached him in seven years so you know that's that's how thorough they are yep yeah. yeah. you know yeah they're 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 very uh, strict with their protocols and they're obviously looking for the best feedback uh, from you and they trust your feedback, Jeff, as I'd say most mm -hmm. NFL teams would. Or yeah, I hope absolutely. So would. Um, uh, yeah, uh, another another team that has, brought, well, actually a team that's brought in Deadwood, in my opinion, is the Jacksonville Jaguars. Tim Tebow is back in the league, Jeff. I want your opinion on that. What do well, you I think will be the course of his 2021 season? I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how it plays out. Do I understand it? I understand it from one, one spot, right? Actually, from two. First of all, I'll start with Tebow. Tim Tebow is a great athlete, right? Now, mm -hmm. he's not mm -hmm. a great quarterback. We know that. Yeah. Right? Now, it's a low-risk, high-reward, potential high-reward move by Jacksonville. He's a Jacksonville-area kid. He's a god in Florida. If he makes a team, you know, they'll, it'll be, you know, it's a smart marketing move. Now, from, from the standpoint of Urban Meyer, this is a guy that understands exactly what you want, right? Mm -hmm. Tim Tebow mm -hmm. was his mouthpiece at Florida. You yes. know, he was the one that was the leader. And they had some, I mean, they, that was when Aaron Hernandez was there and the Poundings mm -hmm. were there and all that mm -hmm. stuff, right? So they had some shaky cats on that team. Mm -hmm. But Tebow was able to be the voice in the locker room that mm -hmm. kept those guys, you know, going in the right direction. So for Urban, even if it's just in training camp, he's going to have another voice in the locker room saying the things that Urban once said. Right. Because here's the way it works. Here's the way it works in a locker room. The coaches are have a big part in creating the quote. I hate this word, but it's the word everybody uses now. Culture. Right. Yes. The culture yeah. on the team. But the reality of it is the players are the ones that that embody or stick to that culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Especially mm -hmm. when it's tough. Okay. Yep. So you need guys in the locker room that, you know, are are live in the kind of way you need, you know, you want guys to be. So I understand it, that two points. This is what my football brain tells me is that it's very, very difficult, even for a great athlete to make that kind of position change, because you're talking about a guy now who's going from being a quarterback and he had, they tried to make a fullback on the punt team out of him and jet with the jets and some of that other stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he, he's going to have to go through, you know, it's a, it's a pretty tough transition. Now he's got mini camps, he's got OTAs and he's got training camp to prove he belongs. I think he's a guy that might hang around a little while. If he can be that third tight end that plays on special teams, that's yeah. a situational mm -hmm. guy yeah. that, that, you know, they may keep him around because of who he is more than, you know, his value as a football player. Was and, a, and mm -hmm. don't, don't, make, don't make any mistake, guys. There's a lot of guys on NFL rosters that are yeah. that guy. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was yeah. Actually, that's the point I was actually going to ask you there was, you know, you, you have this uh, – Jacksonville are definitely in a turning 
in the in the in a turn of chapters, really, in my opinion. And you have a new rookie QB who's just trying to establish himself in the NFL. Do you think that Tim Tebow is going to be a big help for him? Yes, okay, maybe Tebow's not the quarterback anymore, but with motivation and just about how he's been around the league already, how he's going to motivate and, and help Trevor Lawrence, do you think that's going to be where he's valuable as well? Well, I think, I think it, you're exactly right, and I think there's more to the story even than that mm-hmm. because Trevor Lawrence's hero growing up was Tim Tebow. Yeah. And – so what better guy to mentor him in, mm-hmm. in, into what the expectation is like? Because, um, you know, Trent Dilfer told me this one time. I saw him at the Super Bowl and we were talking. And, and I said, Trent, mm-hmm. tell me about it, what it was like going from Fresno State to all of a sudden you're the first player picked and Tampa takes you. And, you, you know, you got to, you, you know, the expectation is that you're going to be the thing that writes the program and, you know, Mm-hmm. And he said, he said, Jeff, I can't even describe to you the enormity of the position. He yeah. said, not just, not just the pressure, but the enormity <laughs> of the position, because everything falls on you and all the expectations are about you. And, you know, you're going to get way more criticism than you deserve and way more praise than you deserve. Mm-hmm. And he said the enormity of the position was something that he just, it took him until he was in Baltimore before he even really understood it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you think that the Jaguars will keep, or keep Tim Tebow on and not cut him just to let Trevor Lawrence play his best football? I I think, I think they would be smart if, whether it's Tim Tebow or anybody in that organization, that's going to help the transition of your franchise quarterback. You better keep that person around. Definitely. And uh, again, you know, this is people, people sometimes get angry when you talk this way, but the reality of it is each of us has a skill set or something that we bring to the table, right? Mm-hmm. And it may be that part of the reason why a guy like Tebow's around there is they want his presence. They want that kind of character guy so that the other guys can, can you know, hopefully learn from that, right? Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I, we, hmm. just lost, we just lost a player to retirement here that's been with us since 2013 when we came to, in, into this program for the first time. And his name's Courtney Steven. And really, at this point in his career, his skills had dissipated, but he would have still made our team mm-hmm. for all the other things he brings. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's why I say, you know, I, I'm not counting Tebow out. Uh, now, again, I think he's got a long, tough road to make the team, but certainly, you know, I'm not counting him out. There you go. That's it. Tight end university as well. It's happening at the moment as we speak. These guys are all meeting. Um, what's your opinion on that, Jeff? Do you think this will help tight ends play better this year? And um, do you think it's more about uh, bonding with each other? I, I think it's a, I think it's three three prong. I think they're trying to create a brand for themselves and yep. awareness of themselves. I mean, then I think that they are going to take that time and enjoy learning from one another. And then mm-hmm. I think that there's a there's a need for that, frankly. And, Mm -hmm. you know, what's really happened, what's changed in the game so much from when I first started in pro football and today is the players are much more empowered today than they ever would have been before. Like you would have never, you would never do this in the past Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because your tight end coach wouldn't want you to do it. You know, you don't want to, you don't want (laughs) to give our secrets to somebody else. (laughs) Yeah, so that's it. But because I, I was wondering, I saw them all talking. Yeah, there's Instagram videos that came out, and I was wondering to myself, they better not be sharing secrets. Oh, you know, I, you but- know they are. You know they are because I tell you what, one of the things that makes football, at least in my experience, unique is that when you watch players after games, they they really, 
you know, and, and they're trading jerseys and they're doing all this and all that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times they're, they're talking shop after the game, right? Mm -hmm. About, hey, man, I saw that. I saw that what you're doing with your swim move. That's really good. Or, yeah. mm -hmm. boy, that double move you on the outside against that corner, you broke him down. Uh, you know, again, and, and, and I think that they respect and know each other enough that, you know, they want to elevate each other's games. I have on my, on yeah. my podcast, my podcast yesterday, we taped a sex, a session with a guy named Byron Chamberlain and Byron has two Super Bowl rings from his time with the, with the uh, Denver Broncos. And then yep. also was a, was a pro bowl receiver tight end for the Vikings. Mm -hmm. And he told me that this is what he did. The Mike Shanahan called him in. They were drafted him as a receiver. And Shanahan called him in and is after the end of his first year. And he said, you know, you remind me a lot of Shannon because Shannon was a big receiver from Savannah State. And then we moved him to tight end. He said, I think you can be a, a Shannon Sharp type tight end. So what he did was he said, as soon as the meeting was over, he went right to the equipment guy who, who runs the equipment. Mm -hmm. Not only the equipment room, but he runs the locker room. He said, I want you to move my locker right down, right next to Shannon Sharp. Wow. Because he mm -hmm. said, if I'm going to play tight end, I want to learn from the best players in the business. And Shannon Sharp is the best player in the business. 